Our guest this week is Jonathan Fryer. We'll be talking about liberalism, the resurgence of liberal centrist politics in the West. We'll be talking about Brexit, and we'll be talking about what liberal foreign policy is. Jonathan Fryer is a British writer, broadcaster, lecturer, and liberal Democrat politician. He studied at Manchester Grammar School before attending Oxford University to read Oriental Studies. Jonathan Fryer was a liberal Democrat candidate in the 2010 general election and has also stood as a liberal candidate for the European Parliament. He served until recently as the chairman of the London Liberal Democrats. He now serves as their spokesperson on Brexit. Fryer has also taught humanities at London University School of Oriental and African Studies. He lectures frequently and through the British Council and Foreign and Commonwealth Office has given seminars on democracy building and on the media in locations as disparate as Egypt, Ethiopia, and Uruguay. Welcome back. Welcome to ANN Satellite Television. It's good to be here for the English Hour, and it's good to have you with us. Our guest today is Jonathan Fryer. We're going to talk about, well, liberal politics, because in, in Britain today that is, we hope, the resurgent political party. And so... The resurgence of liberalism is our first topic for discussion, both in Britain and indeed worldwide. We'll also discuss the issue of Brexit, and we'll also talk about the foreign policy of Britain's Liberal Party. Um, Jonathan, we're going to well, thank you for being with us first and foremost, and we'll kick off with this uh, this first subject: the resurgence of the Liberal Party. The British Liberal Party are traditionally seen as a centre party in the United Kingdom, with the Conservative Party on the right and the Labour Party on the left. During the coalition between the Conservative and Liberal Democrat parties that governed Britain until recent years, the Liberal Democrats lost the trust of their core voters and the party saw a significant reduction in the numbers of their supporters. The party stands for social inclusivity, protection of human rights, and for better, more caring policies on the environment. Since their crushing defeat in the 2015 elections in Britain, the Liberal Democrats have seen a new resurgence in their party numbers and have started to slowly win back many of the local election seats that they lost. Commentators have argued that a divided and weaker Labour Party is making it easier for the Liberal Democrat Party to rebuild itself up from the grassroots where their power tends to lie. So, so Jonathan, the, the, the Liberal Party, I mean, uh, Britain, as our listeners almost certainly know, but most of our listeners are in the Middle East, so some may not, uh, Britain has a three-party, essentially, a, traditionally a three-party system. And you have uh, the right-wing party, the Tory or Conservative party, the left-wing or the supposedly left-wing party, the Labour or Socialist party, and then the traditional view or perspective with regard to traditional British politics is that slapdab in the middle is the Liberal Party, which is what its name would say it was. In other words, it's a, a freedom uh, party. It's a party that believes in freedom of expression and so forth. And it's been rather, in just recently, it's been squashed a little by the, the two major political forces. Was that fair to say? 
Well, certainly if I'd been here 18 months ago, I would have been much less cheerful than I am today because in the 2015 election, the party fell back very badly. Uh, we lost all of our MPs except eight. Mm. But in the sub subsequent months, things have changed quite dramatically since a Conservative government was elected with an overall majority. And so not only have we won one parliamentary by-election, so I now have a new MP, but significantly we've also been winning a lot of local by-elections. And I think that's what's happening. The rebuilding is going to be from the bottom up, which often was actually the area of strength of the Liberal Party, as it used to be called, Liberal Democrats today. And the by-election you won was remarkable because that was a by-election in which the, the conservative candidate for mayor of London was defeated by the, by, by the liberal candidate. Um, and that was quite a remarkable swing. I mean, there were local issues with regard to the, air, the expansion of the airport and so on. But there was also, uh, and we'll be coming to the Brexit issue, there was that there was an issue of um, over the Brexit vote, but regardless of the local, as it were, local issues that may have affected that vote, it was remarkable stunning uh, success for the Liberal Party, wasn't it? It was indeed, because the Conservative MP who resigned and then fought the by-election as an independent, very high-profile figure, thought to be very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had really nailed his colours to the mast of stopping Heathrow expansion, which also the Liberal Democrats were again, so that rather neutered that issue. Mm -hmm. And it did become a Brexit by-election because he was uh, strongly in favour of a Brexit and Britain pulling out of the EU, uh, joining WTO rules and all those sorts of things. But in a constituency that in the referendum last year had voted overwhelmingly to stay in the EU. And indeed, there are a very large number of EU citizens who live in the constituency, even though they were not able to vote in either the by-election or indeed in the referendum. So it became the Brexit by-election. and. Uh, fresh-faced, rather new member of the party, a young uh, lady accountant, one with a remarkable majority. So this is, I mean, this resurgence of liberalism, and we're going to, as I said, we will talk about Brexit later, but it can't be put down purely to Brexit. I mean, liberalism in Britain had, had, a, had a low point where there was a sense of... Um, well, I'm just judging from my own son. Uh, there was a sense of betrayal of, of the university students, um, where a miscalculation, I think, by the liberal establishment, where they decided to row back in order to go into allegiance with the conservatives in that shared government. Um, coalition, I should say, with the conservatives in, in that long period of, of, of shared rule. Um, they decided that one of the sacrifices they'd make was their, their promise over university, free ed university education, um, which bit, was a hard, bitter pill. Do, do, would, I mean, we had had a little bad patch for centrist politics in the United Kingdom. Would you put it down to that, or was it the fact that you were in coalition in government? It was a mixture of the, the tuition fees and being in coalition government with the Conservatives. You're absolutely right. It was a terrible error to make a promise which then could not be fulfilled mm -hmm. about having free tuition, uh, unlike what the Labour Party had introduced when it was in power, mm -hmm. student fees, and of course the Conservatives wanted to maintain, because that really did then allow the other parties to say, well, you can't trust the Liberals. They promised something and they're not going to be able to provide it. They lied, which actually is rather sort of um, a Trumpian post-truth interpretation <laughs> of the facts. Yes. We didn't lie, it's just unfortunately made a promise which yeah. we could not fulfill. But the other thing undoubtedly was the unpopularity from the centre and left ground of British politics of going into partnership with the Conservatives. I still think it was right because Britain had gone through a very rough time after the 2008 financial crisis. There was no overall winner in the 2010 election, and the only m 
mathematically possible combination, unless you involve the Scottish Nationalists, was going to be the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, despite the fact that on, in many ways we are diametrically opposed on a number of issues. But it was interesting when David Cameron uh, was Prime Minister, the predecessor of current Theresa May, he was quite a Liberal Tory on social issues, for example, yes. and therefore yeah. there was a whole range of things on which we could work together, including environmental protection, which, alas, mm -hmm. uh, may now be dismantled by uh, yeah, the current it. government. Yes, yes, yes. And indeed, that's, I mean, going off at a tangent a little, but that's one of the most worrying things about, for some of us, about the Trump government in, in the United States. Uh, whatever you however you regard his foreign policy and his home policy, the one thing that is, to my way of thinking, very disturbing about President Trump is, is his abandonment of environmentalism. Um, and yes, it's very disturbing about Theresa May in Britain, uh, even though it's less extreme, but nonetheless, she's going down the same road, as you rightly say. Uh, it's very short-term and damaging to the health of the world because it is, and it's linked to things. For example, the government is now talking about using Brexit, which we'll talk about later, to reduce uh, regulations covering things like food safety and environmental concerns, so that this will, which will they say will make farming, etc., cheaper. But do we really want to lose a lot of the protection that we've gained over the last 40 years by being a member of the? EU. So it is concerning. And, and unfortunately, even though it's not quite as bad as amongst Trump and the Republicans in America, there is a branch of the current Conservative Party who are quite fundamentalist in being against uh, green issues and uh, yes. believe it's all a myth. Yes. Climate change de yes. deniers, for yes. example. Yes, yeah, so dangerous. <laughs> I mean, we've seen the effects of climate change worldwide. I'm mean, just thinking about the Middle East, um, the, the tragedy of Darfur, uh, which you can blame on um, the, the president of Sudan and the, the Jangjaweed, but there is an unlying, underlying climate issue with the, the burning up of the grasslands and you know less pasture land for the Jangjaweed cattle traders. And you have a similar thing in Syria, of course, there are all sorts of issues with regard to the Syrian war, countless issues. And, uh, but there is also that underlying issue of the, the migration of everybody from northern city, north Syria to the towns as agricultural land has become less and less usable with global warming. It's, it's, it's an international issue and it's a tragedy to see uh, people going and, and Britain when there was the coalition government, which ran for five years up to 2015, and, and the, one of the portfolios that Liberal Democrats held was the energy and environment portfolio, and they brought in um, policies which really made Britain a leader, yes. uh, not only within the, yes. in the European Union, but worldwide leader in climate change talks. Mm. And it's tragic that that is uh, being thrown away. It is, indeed it is. Um, the so the, I mean, do we see, you, you said with some confidence we see a resurgence of what we call it, well, liberal politics, centrist politics. Do we call it centrist politics? Is that a right way of viewing liberal Well, politics? it depends. Because politics has moved to the right, um, I would, <laughs> I suppose, yes, centrist is probably the uh, best term. Many liberal Democrats, including myself, would see our, uh, ourselves as a bit left of center, but not left, uh, left wing as such, being radical on a number of issues, particularly social issues, environmental issues, and things we've mentioned. But yes, I do see a resurgence, and it's very encouraging. Um, I mentioned just in passing, the local election results. In local elections, since 
the general election of May 2015, the Liberal Democrats have come top amongst all, pol uh, all parties and, and have won a significant number of seats, while others have been mainly losing seats. So that is a good sign. But obviously, because we have now, thanks to the coalition government, a fixed-term parliament of five years, there won't be another general election until 2020, unless mm. something extraordinary happens. Yeah, and so we could, we could call an earlier one, couldn't we? Well, the, the, according to the... Well, it's very difficult. Basically, the Prime Minister would have to lose a vote of confidence in the House of Commons. Oh, she can't call She one can't. One. No, that was the whole point of the fixed-term parliament. This I was to stop. What a revelation. This was okay. to stop. Um, when we went into the coalition agreement, the t Conservatives suddenly deciding they wanted to cut and run and try and get an overall majority for themselves, or, or also to stop us if we had wanted to, to oh. try and engineer a, a vote of no confidence. So, no, th it has to be a vote of no confidence. and. I can't really see Theresa May doing that, and she doesn't need it at the moment, although her parliamentary majority is quite small. Um, it's not under great threat, and indeed, just the other day, the Conservatives won a by-election yes, yes. from the Labour so-called opposition, which is, of course, another reason why we are in resurgence at the moment, because the Labour opposition has split it has. badly and is not fulfilling its function as an opposition. Though to be fair, I did think, I mean, that by-election, well, there was an almost an inevitability about the loss of that one because Sellafield, was it? Um, the, <coughs> it's, it's near the nuclear um, yes, uh... power station and the, uh, the, tour, or the, sorry, the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, has kind of um, well, he's uh, he's 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 very much a CND anti anti nuclear weapons certainly and and up to a point um, nuclear power. I mean, he's he, he almost lost that for them single handedly. This whatever his however credible he'd been as a leader with that with that perception of him. They, they didn't stand much of a chance, did they? I mean. Well, that's certainly true to a degree, but I think also we have to remember that even in an area like Copeland, which is the name of that region of northwest England where the by-election was, there was a significant number of people who did revo revo remain in the EU referendum, not a majority by any means, mm. but a significant number. And Jeremy Corbyn had just come out basically saying, right, Brexit's going to happen, we're going to support the government. And that angered a lot of people who genuinely were upset about the Brexit vote. And it's significant that in a by-election where normally you would expect polarization to the two contesting par main parties, actually the Liberal Democrats, we doubled our vote as right. well, whereas we would expect us to get squeezed normally yeah, in that sort yeah. of situation. So but obviously one, one by-election is, you know, mustn't read too much into it. But there definitely is a resurgence. The party membership uh, has grown substantially. It's now higher than it has been ever since um, the uh, joining of the old Social Democrat Party and the old Liberal Party. Well, it's very exciting. It, it's certainly interesting because we. Are, what's good about it? We we are seeing politics um, polarize. I was seeing more extreme nationalism, more more extreme right wing politics, and um, you may even see the. Election of Marie Le Pen. Who knows? As, uh, you know, I mean, we see. Let's hope not. <laughs> but, but it certainly has been uh, an interesting trend politically, and it it would be good to have uh, healthy, I think, for the state of the world, to have a resurgence in in whatever we call it, centrist I mean, politics. There are good examples. I mean, Justin Trudeau, who won the Canadian yes, elections, yes. a prime example and a brilliant example of a liberal, self-professed liberal 
politician leading a Liberal Party who in quite a short period of time has introduced lots of Liberal message, uh, me, yes. uh, policies, yeah. personally welcomed refugees from Syria and elsewhere, some of whom were pictured fleeing over from the American border through the snow to uh, get into safer Canada once Trump had been elected. Uh, so it's not all bad news that internationally for liberalism at all and indeed several of the EU member states have liberal prime ministers and within the European Parliament the liberal group is very strong. Well bless you that's a good segue into our next section for our discussion because we're going to move on to liberal foreign policy so we'll do that right now. Liberal foreign policy has at its core a commitment to peaceful internationalism. The concept of internationalism is based on advancing cooperation between states and a belief that states are better off working together than in opposition to one another. Liberal foreign policy looks to diplomacy and multilateralism to resolve disputes, with interventionism and violence being a last resort. Liberal foreign policy rejects isolationist and protectionist agendas and instead supports wholeheartedly institutions such as the United Nations and the European Union that unite states under common values. Liberalism seeks to promote the rights and interests of individuals and groups within society. A commitment to advancing free trade is also central to the Liberal outlook. The UK Liberal Democrat Party are the UK's most internationalist party. The party is committed to promoting human rights and international law. So, Liberal foreign policy, um, and specifically the British Liberal Party, its foreign policy, because uh, it's important. It, it said, sends a signal to the other two parties, and it, it matters to all of us, therefore, um, quite apart from the fact that it matters to those of us who might want to vote for you. Um, and it matters to the world because, because they can see the way free-thinking foreign policy is going in the West. I mean, um, where do you want to begin uh, internationally with regard to the to the big issues that our listeners be certainly interested in the Middle East? Uh, where you're coming from there? Well, certainly internationalism is the cornerstone of Liberal Democrat policy on the foreign stage, and indeed has been for a very long time. In the 19th century, we had a prime minister called Gladstone who um, mm. spoke up for the oppression of Bulgarians and others under the declining Ottoman Empire. So there is quite a history of not just caring about what happens to the people of Britain, but to the people of the world. And that's a very caring internationalism uh, linked to a belief in free trade, but not the full red-blooded free trade that sometimes um, was the case in the, the 19th century, but resisting protectionism, recognizing that we live in a globalized world increasingly, despite efforts by Trump and others to perhaps row yes. back on that. And we have to make it work in a way that actually brings benefits for everybody, not just the rich, but also the poor, not just the Western countries, but also the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world that have been going through all sorts of problems in recent years. But there are arguably two flaws with uh, free trade when you're talking about globalization because there certainly has been a reaction against that and uh, part of the part of the um, move of politics to the right has been a reaction against globalization and part of that is because of a sense well I mean the, the banking crisis has got to be an element. Um, I mean, I'm not sure people analyze it, but, but that sense that they're, they're being burdened by, by globalization, by um, you know, the big banks and, and all the rest, um, the, you, you, you get this feeling that the next generation will be paying off, off the debt of the profligate bankers. 
well, they will be, um, no, no question about it. Um, so globalization, and then up against that, we have no anti-dumping laws in Britain. And you have nations like China who um, are using virtual slave labor in some instances, or at least exploited labor. Um, to undercut and to uh, dump produce in, in the West. Um, so you have, I mean, I remember it from my own experience because I, was, I worked in South Wales for many years and after the miners' strike, when Maggie was keen to close the mines, uh, the coal mines, um, there was a period where we accepted imports of South African and Chinese coal for the first time. And the Chinese coal was being sold at a price that was lower than the cost of, of shipping the coal because the Chinese wanted to corner the market and, to, and they were dumping coal. Yes, that's why I say we don't believe in red-blooded free trade. There has, has to be fair free trade because if people are subsidizing unfairly exports, then that is not genuine free trade, that is subsidized mm. trade. But don't let's just focus on that because there are many other issues which I think are worthwhile stressing, yes, not, not least the centrality of human rights, freedoms that you referred to earlier um, as part of a liberal approach to the world, uh, a belief that everybody, whatever their religion, their ethnicity, their age, their gender, or whatever, um, should have respect and should have be included in society nationally and internationally. Um, and certainly when um, people have moved to the party in, in recent months and in some cases recent years, it's not only been over Brexit, there's been things such as the fact that it was the Liberal Democrats who stood up against um, new surveillance powers, yes. um, all sorts yeah, of issues which there. really threatened mm -hmm. individual freedom. Yeah. And we, we you yes, know, it, it's all very well having security and we're all in favor of security, but we, we are a country in which now we have more CCTV, I understand, per head than any other country in the world and where the government is pushing through new powers which will enable them to read our emails and check our internet browsing history, which leaves many British people who, who are naturally liberal with a small L um, feeling uncomfortable. It's very know. interesting, isn't it? I, I don't find... I don't <clears throat> find the CCTV, and we certainly have more than any other country in the world, when it works, but I don't find that intrusive because it's, in theory anyway, protects my son or daughter when they go out in the street and, um, and it may make us a less violent society, possibly. But I do mind intrusion into personal privacy, uh, the snooping charter, as it were, the ability of the, the government, um, given uh, under the, because of the threat of international terrorism, to monitor everybody. And um, I think it's plain wrong. And, the, and I think that the Liberal, attempt, Liberal Party attempt to introduce checks and balances is really mm -hmm. good. But could I ask you, I um, mean, on the sensitive foreign policy issues. Um, Israel and Palestine, for instance. Um, does the Liberal Party have a clear, straight policy, or do, do you fudge it? Where, where do you come? Well, the policy, um, not only with the Liberal Democrats, but I suspect with the other parties as well, is going through uh, intense uh, review at mm. the moment. In fact, we're going to have a motion at the Autumn Party Conference in Bournemouth in the south of England um, in September, and a m resolution on Israel-Palestine calling for the recognition of the state of Palestine yeah. and really alerting um, people to the fact that 
though in principle we still support a two-state solution, the colonization policy of Israel in the West Bank, where more and more settlements are being built in flagrant um, uh, violation of international law, is going to make a two-state solution impossible unless it's stopped and reversed. And if that happens, then there are very serious uh, questions about what sort of one-state solution would emerge afterwards, because clearly it couldn't be a one-state Jewish state with mm. a very substantial Palestinian Arab, probably majority Palestinian Arab population. So these are very, it, these are very difficult times. I mean, poor Middle East has been through a lot of difficult times, and it's the 50th anniversary of the occupation yes. this year. But it's, a, it's I believe, a, it, really, it yeah. is indeed 1967, the Six yeah. Day War. Yeah. So we have a situation basically where, where it's the situation is on a knife edge. And if something's not done extremely quickly, then it would have tipped over into a situation where a viable state of Palestine is no longer possible. Mm -hmm. And that's very dangerous as well as being completely unjust and indeed in violation of international law because according to the Geneva Convention and the Hague Agreement, uh, an occupying power, power cannot settle its own people, cannot seize this, that and the other, cannot imprison people without due uh, process, all sorts of things which have been violated. So I hope that gives you a flavour of, of the debate that is going on in the party at the moment. Uh, I mean, if you look up, I think like most political parties in Britain at the moment, it will be say something rather woolly about we support a two-state solution which can meet the needs of uh, p people and of course to, to accept um, the state of Israel exists, uh, it's recognized, etc. But a situation has to develop, if it can be saved, in which Israel can live in partnership rather than in a much more unhealthy relationship with its neighbors. Well, that's very powerfully said. What about, I mean, very powerful indeed, but then what about the other big issue that affects the Middle East, that of well, I'll call it interventionism. Um, the, we've seen uh, Britain and its big brother America, or big sister, whatever, uh, have intervened in, in um, Iraq and Afghanistan um, and with a British lead, not an American lead, but with a British lead intervened in Libya um nearly but didn't intervene I mean, and there's an argument there but anyway didn't intervene in syria but you um are you is is the liberal party interventionist uh only in certain circumstances, not as a general principle, no. I think it's worthwhile recalling that in 2003, the Liberal Democrats opposed the Iraq war, and our then leader, Charles Kennedy, now sadly no longer with us, um, was vilified in the House of Commons um, because he stood up repeatedly warning, do not go into Iraq, do to Tony Blair, do not uh, join George Bush, and indeed we now know that in a sense, Tony Blair was actually enc encouraging George Bush yes. to go. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, as I say, we, we are only interventionist in certain circumstances, and those would tend to fit within the framework of the evolving concept in international law of responsibility to protect, um, now becoming a basic fundamental of international law, which is that if a government um, is not uh, ensuring that its people don't starve is not um, ensuring that there are a reason, at least a tolerable level of human rights, then the international community has a moral obligation to do something about it. But military intervention is absolutely not the, la the first step. It is the last step in case of failure of diplomacy, sanctions, or the whole menu of things. The Canadians have been absolutely central in formulating this policy, which is why in the case of Libya, in principle, 
we as a party supported action against Muammar Gaddafi because of the television broadcasts that were going out by him and his son Saif al-Islam saying they were going to pull people from the cupboards of Benghazi and slaughter them and and it seemed you know a genuine danger but the huge problem in Libya which is why it lost our support was because there was no plan afterwards and I mean you know it's all very well to remove a leader though in a tribal society that's perhaps not a very good idea uh, but hopeless if there's no plan for what actually happens later and therefore we've seen huge disruption and disintegration since since then yes we have and and is that not i mean is that not the our fault i mean is that not this problem because surely in the libyan context i would argue um interventionism was wrong. Um, the I mean, we we intervened, yes, for for good reasons, uh, but without any forethought, without a true commitment to what was going to happen afterwards, without any plan. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think also w w without recognizing that Libya was not a normal country, um, Gaddafi since 1969 had basically ensured that there was no alternative uh, center of power there was no proper structure his rather idiosyncratic um, political ideology meant that nobody else could challenge him and there was no structure there to take over um, when he was removed so and you, so you, would you have to admit we clearly made a mistake I mean the we have now three governments in Libya indeed uh, in, in, in hindsight uh, it was not a good idea at the time um, many people in this country, including myself, supported it because we felt that the people of Benghazi were really in imminent danger of a huge massacre. Mm. It's, uh, it, is, it is disturbing. I mean, I, uh, it, the, the risk is that we can see this, if we take the Canadian sort of, we, 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 we can again and again be intervening naively and making things worse. I mean, in almost every instance of our intervention, uh, not, not ex certainly not excluding Iraq, not excluding Afghanistan, um, not excluding Libya, obviously. Um, we've made things worse, really. I mean, in real terms, I just I find it deeply disturbing. Um, if we had gone in and invaded, fine. I mean, if the international community decided to invade the country, we're going to run it for 50 years, fine. But we don't do that. We go in, mess it up, try and put our own stamp on it and walk away. I mean, it's just, um, I'm very uh, sorry. <laughs> it's your opinions we're seeking. <laughs> and I'm here pontificating. Okay. Yeah. But, um, but, uh, but liberal, um, no, I mean, uh, but I do, I do respect your views. And I, and I do think that's what you're saying about the, certainly about Israel and Palestine is very encouraging and it's very encouraging to hear somebody come out with such a, a thoughtful position on foreign policy we have got to move on to the to that old chestnut brexit uh, so we'll, we'll maybe better stop there with this and and move ahead Brexit has dominated global political discussion since the United Kingdom's public decision to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June 2016. In the aftermath of the shocking result, the UK government went through a comprehensive change, with Theresa May becoming the new Prime Minister. She now faces the unwieldy task of striking a deal with the European Union's 27 countries. So far, Mrs. May has taken an uncompromising stance to the referendum result. She controversially refused to guarantee the rights of 3.5 million European citizens living and working in the United Kingdom to avoid weakening the UK government's negotiating position. She has also made no promise to remain within the European single market, the largest free trading arena in the world. 
the UK-EU relationship has historically been mutually beneficial. 44% of UK's goods and services are exported to the European Union and 10% of the British National Health Service workforce is comprised of EU nationals. So, so Jonathan, um, Brexit, it's, it's a subject, actually, oddly enough, uh, you wouldn't think it, but because of the way things are and because this is a programme in Britain, we've discussed it uh, a few times on, on uh, ANN television. It's um, obviously seminal for the world. I mean, why is it seminal for the world? Because to my way of thinking, it was the first big populist anti-establishment vote that we've seen and now we've had the second big populist anti-establishment vote the election of Trump in America and it is people I, th I suspect that it had as much to do with people wanting to punish the establishment as it did have anything to do with rational belief in, in, in Brexit. Um, and that desire to punish the establishment, you could say, is healthy, because in many countries of the world, people have to pick up a gun if they want to punish the establishment. And here they could, they could make a, a big protest vote. Well, I would agree with if, if the consequences were not so serious as potentially they're going to be. It's all very good to have protest votes, but not if they bring about um, an end to a relationship with, with which I and other Liberal Democrats believe Britain has done very well as member of the European Union. In fact, the, the old Liberal Party, out of which the Liberal Democrats grew, always wanted Britain to join, be part of Europe. We were the only party that was campaigning for that originally um, and uh, have been the most enthusiastic members, while both Conservatives and Labour have shilly-shallied from one side to the other at different mm. times in their history. So we were very, very active in the EU referendum campaign last year, and obviously most of us were absolutely mortified by the outcome. And I'm sure you're you're right that a significant proportion of the electorate did not vote about the question. The question was, should Britain remain a member of the European Union or leave? And yes, most of us answered that question, but a very significant number of people had no idea what the EU was, because no government had ever bothered mm. to tell yes. them. Yes. Indeed, the day after the referendum, the most popular Google search in Britain was, what is the EU? I can't <laughs> help feeling, well, couldn't you have asked that yesterday before you actually <laughs> voted? But they voted against London, against Cameron, uh, for all sorts of reasons. Mm. And it was a very natural narrow victory. I mean, the, it saddens me that the Prime Minister, Theresa May, is going, has sort of adopted the narrative of, of the right wing of her party and of the UK Independence Party, the out-and-out uh, leavers, by saying basically, well, now the British public has given a clear mandate to leave. No, one has a significant minority, probably a minority, in Britain who are feeling very bruised, very unhappy indeed. And that's certainly the case in London, where London voted overwhelmingly to stay, because London has done very well as uh, an international, open, cosmopolitan city, including having hundreds of thousands of workers from other EU member states, which, of course, is one reason why some people in other parts of the country voted to leave. Absolutely. And, and I mean, yet, you, you talk of this, I mean, campaign... It was the, the, the standard of debate in the campaign, I mean, is, is it worth readdressing, but was um, there was a lot of discussion of economic issues and, uh, you, and, and indeed a lot of false statements from those that campaigned to leave and you half expected that because you had a, a range of rascals there on that campaign. 
but from those who campaigned to remain the whole thing was economic issues it was and very it was very frustrating frankly being part of 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 a, uh, an umbrella group of, of different campaigns that were going on, that the campaign coming out of the government, particularly for the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, so-called Finance Minister George Osborne, who was basically saying, if we leave, it's going to be economic disaster, yes. and, and um, unfortunately played into the hands of the other side, who then said, oh, it's project fear, project fear, you know, people are not telling you the truth. Because what should have happened is that the government, not just the current mm. or Cameron's Conservative government, but successive governments should have explained why being in the EU was good. And they never did. No, they, they, it was fear, a constant yes. narrative about you know Britain fighting against the other members of the European Union, going off to Brussels, whether it was Mrs Thatcher with her handbag or male leaders going off to have it out with the uh, our European partners who, if one believed the popular press, uh, are only there to sort of try and stop Britain succeeding. So it was deeply frustrating. And as I say, the outcome is very depressing. And we're right in the middle now of, of the pre-Brexit process in the sense that the whole, formally, it hasn't started yet. It will only start when the Prime Minister um, invokes so-called Article 50, which she hopes to do by the end of this month, though with a vote in the House of Lords that's just happened, yes, it may be more difficult. Interesting. I, I mean, yeah, I was... Um I voted leave. I was the only person in my extended family, my my entire extended family, my children, my sisters, my brother-in-laws, everybody I know other than myself voted remain. Um, and part three of the factors were the, the three statements in the run-up um, to the election immediately just before the vote. Uh, one was Obama saying Britain goes back to the back of the queue. Uh, one was the um, Chancellor saying uh, you'll, we'll have to have an emergency budget. And one was the World Bank uh, uh, chairman, that lady, um, of the, I think it's the World Bank. Christian Lagarde from yes. the IMF. Yes. IMF, of course, IMF uh, lady, um, saying house prices in Britain will collapse uh, if if we leave, mm. and I thought, thank God about the house prices. We need them to collapse. <laughs> and the other two irritated me. And then, so when I was standing in the polling booth, I stood for at least two minutes with my little pencil poised, trying to decide. But that was a factor, just irritation with um, these three. But it's going to have a huge difference. Um, in um, or will it? I mean, does it re is it really going to change anything? It will change a lot if, as the Prime Minister has indicated, we will leave the European single market. We won't get into the technicalities of it all, but basically we are part of the world's largest trading bloc with a single market, so companies and sole traders and professionals can operate throughout the whole 28-member bloc. If we leave the single market, as the Prime Minister is saying we will, that will see um, and it's going to make it much more difficult to trade and work and indeed the Home Secretary Amber Rudd uh, the other day also said freedom of movement which is a central principle of the single market for which Britain British Conservative um, government was responsible uh, is going is a thing of the past it's over it's not going to be the same and that's very worrying for um, the three and a half million EU citizens who currently live and work and study in this country. Very worrying for the more than, no one's quite sure how many, at least one million, maybe two million British expats living, living on the Europe. continent. Yeah. Um, and 
a lot of businesses, including farmers, are very worried that they will not be able to find workers. Indeed, the National Health Service, a significant proportion of national health nurses and ancillary workers are EU citizens. If they no longer have the automatic right to live and work here, it could start hitting not just the economy, but the whole fabric of British society as it has developed, which is why I think it's good that the House of Lords has applied a certain break. And I, you know, Theresa May is not going to listen to me, but if she did, I would tell her that slow it down, don't rush ahead with this. If you're going, and OK, you said we're going, and it does look as though we will leave the EU, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's interesting. You're, you're talking about, I'm with you on nurses, and not with you on farmers. I, uh, I've spent many years living in the southwest. Need my father's a Cornishman, and um, um, I did farm for a number of years. And we have a flower picking industry, and and, and cauliflower picking, and everything else. You know, that depends on farm labour. Up until a decade ago, that farm labour was all local, all local, and now, without exception, it's all. Europeans, none of the locals are employed. And it was useful because uh, you know how destructive tourism can be because of seasonal work. Um, so in, in the Southwest, uh, if there's too much tourism, too much dependence on tourism, then it means you get people with summer jobs, no jobs in the winter or spring. Um, farm laboring type work, flower picking and so on, at least, to, particularly for young people, gave them some low paid, but gave them some employment out of season. Now that that's gone, because the farmers have found an even cheaper source of labor to exploit, with Romanians and others coming over and doing the work, um, I think that that's, we have to, anyway, we have to be, Careful about the free movement of people doesn't mean the free exploitation of, 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 of people. Um, and indeed, uh, London with, um, with I, I know uh, a, a girl that often stays with us, it does volunteer work in the, um, uh, dealing with the sex industry. The, uh, and the problem we have with uh, the trafficking of women in Britain is extraordinary um, and shameful, and many of them coming again from East Europe. Um, so the free movement of, I would like to see some checks and balances on the free movement of labor uh, in that sense. The, thing, the, the really sad thing is that um, because it was a black and white issue in the vote mm. with, with um, um, uh, consequences that now probably can't be avoided, we missed a fantastic opportunity to help reshape the European Union. Britain was due to become, take over the presidency of the EU on the 1st of July this year. That now won't happen for obvious reasons. Mm. Um, it was a golden opportunity to set a reform agenda. And I do criticize David Cameron for not really seizing that opportunity and instead of trying to get a sort of very minimal deal um, with our EU partners, not sitting down with them because in the European Union they don't have the confrontational politics that we're used to from the House of Commons and the British political system. You sit down for months, years if necessary and negotiate compromise positions and there is real readiness amongst many of our EU partners to fundamentally reform the EU and we ought to be in there doing that. And even if we do leave, or when we leave, as now seems inevitable, it's important that we um, encourage that process of reform and make sure we do still have a close working relationship. But at the moment, the government seems to want to have its cake and eat it in the sense that they want to leave the single market, but they have the same trading relationships with our EU partners. And that, you know, two plus two does not equal five. So given that you are, uh, certainly for London, um, the the Brexit spokesman for the Liberal 
Democrat Party. Um, and you are standing for a liberal policy with regard to this issue. What is it? Is it that we should have a second vote, a second referendum, or is it that we should uh, ignore the result of the no, referendum? You can't, you can't ignore the result, and it would be wrong to ignore the result. That, you know, it, we live in a democracy, and it was, mm. even if it was technically an advisory vote, it shouldn't be ignored. However, what we do believe is that there should be another vote, not a second referendum, not a rerun, of last time in the hope that we'll get a different answer, but a referendum on the deal which is negotiated over the next two years by the government. So because, to put it in, in simple words, the British public voted for a destination to leave, but or direction rather, direction to leave, but not a destination. There was no programme about what actually would happen, uh, where we would be, what sort of situation we would be in. So over the next two years, the government will be negotiating with our 27 partners a, an exit deal. Mm. And our party policy is that then Theresa May should go before Parliament to say this is what we've negotiated and then put it to a public vote. Is this acceptable or would you rather stay? Now, should that public vote be the next general election? I mean, are we, is that a simpler way of putting it or you're not? I don't think it should be the next general election. I mean, it may well be if the timetable is delayed that they will coincide because mm. um, if Theresa May invokes Article 50 at the end of this month, that would mean in principle we would leave in March 2019 and the general election is scheduled for May the following year. So there's a certain um, gap in between. But I don't think it would be right to have a general election that is all about Brexit, mm. um, which is why I think it should be a discrete, a distinct issue on which there could be a vote. Um, I suspect the turnout would be far lower than it was for the last referendum because those people who made their protest about whatever it was they were protesting about will not be interested in the nitty gritties of trade regulations. So you want a referendum on the deal? You want on the deal. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes or no vote to the deal. Yes. And if it's no, you want a renegotiation? A renegotiation or our policy, we would then go into the general election of 2020 saying we believe we're better off in and ideally we would stay in. But if we're leaving, if it's absolutely going to happen, then we've got to mitigate the circumstances, we've got to ensure it does not hurt people and that we keep as close a relationship as possible with our near neighbours. Interesting. And, and, and to finally, and as a last point, are you a true internationalist? Do you believe in a world without frontiers? And uh, do, do you go that far? Well, you know, I'm very fond of history and I read um, travelers and others who used to travel without passports and um, uh, the world didn't have frontiers until relatively recent in human history. But I'm not uh, a blind idealist. I don't think we could ever go back to that stage. But we in Britain are very lucky. We actually have a passport that allows us to travel almost everywhere. And I know for many people, not only in Syria, for much of the Middle East and North Africa, that's just an impossible dream. It's very difficult to travel. And I think it's awful that therefore people by wherever they're born, wherever they're living, are handicapped, whereas we in the privileged, uh, rich Europe and North America can go where we want. Mm. That's interesting. Jonathan, we've, we've run out of time, but thank you. That really is powerfully said and, and very interesting indeed. Bless you and thank you for being our guest on ANN. Really kind of you. Thank you. So again, what did we learn from Jonathan? Uh, interesting discussion. Uh, the whole issue of the resurgence of liberal politics is an important one. Important because it's healthy for the world. You look at a situation where the world's politics is becoming more nationalistic, more right-wing. Um, is there anything wrong with that? Well, no, not in principle, as long as you have 
an alternative. And, and I think we need centrist politics. We need strong centrist politics because otherwise the alternative is just the extremes. You just have the left wing and the right wing. And we need that, that middle ground to be held by a strong political force. So it's healthy, not just for Britain, but for the world at large, if you have what we tend to call liberal politics, center politics, uh, retaining some real hold on political strength. And then we came to liberal foreign policy. And it was interesting, in a way, because there's a little bit of a paradox here. In a sense, liberal foreign policy, certainly in Britain, is more radical than left-wing foreign policy. Traditionally, the British Labour Party has been allied up to a point to the state of Israel. I mean, there has been a great sympathy. It's a natural sympathy, given the Holocaust and events in Europe and the time of the Second World War. There is, there is a great sympathy um, in the British left for the state of Israel. Um, in the British left wing, that is, of British politics, the, the socialist wing. And um, it's interesting to see the Liberal Party coming out with the more radically strong pro-Palestinian party. Uh, of course, we, we're all pro-Israel, we're pro-Palestine, we're all pro-one world, we're pro-everybody. But at the end of the day, we want fair play. And fair play is more important today than justice. We can never achieve justice for the Palestinians. How can we ever manage that, given all they have suffered? But we can achieve fair play from this point now forward. And that's what we'd like to see. And I quite, I'm quite respectful of liberal policy in that regard. Um, and finally, we talked about Brexit. You're probably fed up with Brexit on ANN satellite television, because we talked about it a lot. But Jonathan Fryer is spokesperson for the Liberal Party on this issue, or certainly London's spokesperson. It's an important issue because of what it says to the world. Uh, I'm, I think you heard me say I voted Brexit, but um, British exit from Europe. But I had grave qualms uh, because we do need to live in a more internationalist world. We need to have more of a brotherhood and sisterhood of mankind. That's the way forward in the long term. And so in that sense, I was wrong. He is right. Uh, we need greater internationalism. Thank you for being with us on ANN Satellite Television. It's been good to have you here today. Thank you.